and welcome to episode number 78 of the Knitting Teaspoon podcast. I'm Lisbeth, your host, and this is a podcast which is all about knitting, sewing, spinning, weaving, basically all of the fiber crafts that I feel like. There have been a few this week, so stay tuned. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's good to be back and also it's good to be back to somewhat of a schedule. Uh, apparently I'm podcasting on the last weekend of the month for now. We'll see if that stays the same, but I'm trying to, to get in a, into a rhythm of podcasting at least once a month. Uh, for now, uh, yeah, I, I seem to be on track. So I know last time I um, said like, yay, I managed to make it in May and then with editing it became slightly later even than I had wanted, but uh, yeah, life happens sometimes. Um, yeah, so let's uh, get started. Uh, first, a quick mention of what I'm wearing. This is a Rosa shirt. This is a pattern by Tilly and the Buttons. The fabric is from Poppy Designs uh, or Poppy Europe. I don't know exactly what the right name of uh, the company is, but they design children's fabrics and I happen to like children's fabrics, so I don't care. <laughs> I, I, I'm wearing uh, children's fabrics all the way. Anyway, so let's get right into the contents of this episode. Let's start off with the finished object. I will have shown you guys uh, this blanket before and it's finished now. So uh, yeah, I think I was almost done uh, with the blanket when I last recorded. I think, I'm not even sure if this is the last row that I did or, yeah, this, this must be the last row that I did. Uh, so I think I was like, maybe two blocks of the last row were already finished and by the time I finished editing, basically I already finished the blanket as well. So um, I think there's even a picture on Ravelry. I did uh, do a quick update on my Ravelry because I was apparently slacking off a little bit and keeping it up to date. So in case you're wondering about my projects, I try to keep some notes there, though I will admit that most of my notes probably are not that useful. But if you're interested in what type of yarn I use for projects, um, uh, that's typically a place, that, that's something that I typically do, um, do write down there. I wish I would also write down what needle size I used for a project because sometimes I want to knit something out of the same uh, weight of yarn again and then it would be nice to like remember um, what needles I knit something up to achieve a certain gauge but uh, yeah. <sighs> I, uh, I'm sometimes lazy so <laughs> I, I, uh, I will upload a project uh, sometimes months after I've actually finished it, so uh, yeah. Um, anyway, so this blanket is done and it's on the couch, which is really nice, especially for my husband, because oh my, our baby is in the habit of uh, waking up very early. Usually by five in the morning, we still need some sleep. <laughs> anyway, so uh, let's get into the next project. Uh, this is a hat. Um, I did not follow any pattern. I just went for a beanie uh, and it's out of uh, bright uh, rainbow colors. Uh, and this is hand spun. So I spun this yarn, I think last year, because I, I purchased this yarn with the intention of maybe making some diaper covers, but we're not using that many diaper covers uh, anymore. We um, switch to uh, another system that they like better at Digger. And um, yeah, so I need a head out, out of this. Um, the fiber came from a company called Schaap & Draak, which you may have heard me talk about before because I really, really like that company. <laughs> they have beautiful yarns and, and also um, fiber to spin with. And uh, it's actually one of the few companies I know in the Netherlands that uh, do sell fiber as well. So. Uh, yeah, hand dyed uh, fiber from the Netherlands, and this is 100% BFL, which so far is my favorite uh, fiber type to spin with. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> what more can I say? I uh, really enjoyed this project. This also made me somewhat happier during a pretty dark period. Um, earlier this month, my grandpa was supposed to turn 91, but uh, a few days before his birthday, he sadly passed away. Um, yeah, so that um, 
that was yet another emo emotional roller coaster to go down, even though I'm convinced that my grandpa actually had a pretty good life. Uh, I mean, he was still driving his own car on the day he died. He went to his garden that he had on, like my grandpa used to be a farmer and uh, when he retired the farm went to my uncle and now my uncle has also moved away from the farm but they still keep the land but my grandpa still has a, a plot of land there where, where he or had I should say uh, a plot of land where he would grow some of his veggies and, uh, and stuff and uh, yeah he was actually still enjoying gardening on his very last day I don't think there are many 90 years old year olds who can still say they can drive a car and and uh, do a lot of gardening so he, he must have had a pretty good life until the end so still it meant funeral <laughs> and uh, well m most of the things were positive memories but still uh, still it's a dark time and uh, yeah w we obviously miss him and uh, also one of the things that uh, feels really sad is that very shortly after um, after he passed away uh, I was allowed to make my vaccine appointment uh, still haven't had my first shot by the way it's scheduled for next week so Fingers crossed I won't have any side effects uh, from that, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, we were planning on visiting my grandparents again when we at least had had our first job, uh, but sadly that was just a little bit too late. Um, still, um, we were happy that the restrictions were lifted somewhat so that we could, as a family, all be present at, uh, at the funeral, which might not have been allowed like a month before so that that's a good thing I guess <laughs> anyway so I um, made a hat to cheer me up it's a beanie it's um, yeah it fits nice on my head I actually finished this hat twice but then I decided I started to decrease this a little bit too early and I didn't like uh, how it would sit on my head like it would be over my ears or like on top of my ears and I like I had to also kind of cover the top part of my ears so I like this better this will probably make sure that I will have a bad hair day for the rest of this episode but you know what now you know why so <laughs> there we go um finished hat then there is another project something that I had shown already last episode and I'm still knitting on my sock in a sock baby sock socks uh, for my son. Um, here they are. Um, as you can see they are both on the same needle. I'm just knitting them inside each other uh, which is a challenge for me. Um, I'm still not convinced that I will do this again especially because I don't know to what extent you can see it but this sock like this one it is slightly bigger than the other one. <laughs> I, apparently I knit tighter um, on the front sock, the, like on the outer sock than on the inner sock, which is not really what I would have expected. Like I would kind of have expected that the inner sock would be somewhat more compressed and maybe smaller because of that, but apparently the inner sock is even bigger than the outer sock. So maybe my gaze, gauge would be even worse if, <laughs> if it weren't for this. But uh, yeah, it was quite a challenge to uh, knit the heels um, while they were inside of each other because obviously it's very hard to see what you're doing that way but I think it worked out uh, decently. I know that I've made a mistake on that, uh, on one side of one of the socks but um, yeah I wasn't going back because it was far too tedious. At some point I, uh, I had this feeling like ha huh, now I know how to do it so if I ever decide to knit socks like this again I will know how to do it and uh, yeah it will be easier then. Um, for now it should be like pretty much smooth sailing until I reach the toe and I think I'm about well maybe somewhat over halfway to the point where I start to knit to do toe decreases. Uh, this is pretty easy uh, knitting. I am not going very fast on this project because it requires some attention and um, yeah I uh, don't always want to knit um, like that focused. So yeah slow progress but still progress. 
on my sock, in a sock sock. Something I did also mention last week that I was uh, going to try and do is knit some brioche and um, yeah so I did um, and here it is I'm knitting a cow it is the ring of fire cow from the book by Nancy Marchand um, yeah I don't know exactly what I can say about uh, the book um, but uh, yeah it, it's uh, really helpful to to get started with brioche I didn't need to look up any videos or anything to to get started just reading the book and they had very clear pictures in, inside to uh, tell you how to to do it so uh, yeah that was nice um, I have a, a whole bunch of colorful markers uh, hanging around here um, which helped me uh, keep track of all the repeats and I know that the orange marker means <laughs> at the end of the round for me um, I'm not really sure uh, how long I will knit this cowl. I um, the pattern didn't specify any number of repeats, and I can kind of imagine that it's also up to the taste of the person. But I don't think I've ever actually knit a cowl before, so I don't know what is a decent length for a cowl. So maybe if any of you guys knows, uh, please let me know what what your favorite length is for a cowl. Like there there is a um, obviously a, a width that is uh, already decided because I'm knitting in a circle but uh, yeah I, I could possibly uh, measure this and then write it down on the screen <laughs> before the end of the podcast so that you will know maybe that like I don't know if there's a certain length to width ratio or anything that you like or the, there's just a length and uh, that you prefer or I don't know uh, Obviously, I'm not going to change the width now, but uh, I might still change the length somewhat. Uh, yeah, I, I'm really enjoying knitting the brioche. I uh, the, the first round was a bit of a struggle, also because there was a different type of cast on than, than I'm used to. Um, and then the first round is already a patterned round, so I'm not sure if, if I were to knit this pattern again, if I would uh, do that again. Like. Um, this brioche has like one one round with increases or decreases uh, in the brioche and one round that is just like the basic brioche uh, stitch and um, yeah the pattern starts right away with an increase and decrease round and I think that maybe if I were to knit this pattern again that I would start with a, like an easy round first and then uh, start doing the decreases and increases because that makes it somewhat easier also to keep track of whether or not you're twisting the yarn. I think I did an okay job on not twisting the yarn, but actually I tend to fidget a little bit if I, uh, you know, if uh, I did happen to twist uh, the yarn and I will just make, like, I will cheat a little bit. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not always going back to, to fix it especially not with a large number of stitches and a difficult type of skip and stitch. Although I must say uh, the first round was a little bit difficult, but you're getting into a rhythm quite quickly with brioche. Um, and it's a nice rhythm, so uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it started to become quite intuitive, like even on the first repeat already, so that that's really nice. I, I enjoy it. Um, one thing I will do, um, this I, I don't think maybe you can see the contrast, of these yarns as much. I have them in here in my little project bag and like the colors are very much matching. Um, and one is clearly darker than the other. Um, on the inside you can see the contrast a little bit starker because um, well the shade coincides with the darker color here so that makes the dark color look even darker and a lighter color even brighter so uh, yeah i'm not sure which one i will use as the right side um, but this is yarn that i have dyed myself so uh, it's uh, it's a sock yarn i call it sturdy socks i uh, have had it for sale for a while in my etsy shop but i closed my etsy shop a while ago because 
honestly, I don't feel like keeping track of an Etsy shop as well. So uh, I decided to keep all of the yarns that I had not sold and uh, just close the shop and call it a day there. Um, but uh, that means that I get to use all of my own yarns, which I'm finally doing. Um, and I really like this yarn as a sock yarn, uh, which is which it is mostly intended for. I mean, it's a, it's a wool nylon blend, um, but it's it's a bit rough. Like it's not the softest yarn. Um, it's also why I call it sturdy sock yarn because it it feels very strong, but like maybe a lush, uh, fluffy merino yarn or something with silk content would be better for a cow. So I'm not sure if I'll actually wear this. I, I do really like the colors. They are really right up my alley, uh, which is also why I uh, dyed four colors of this. Like they're, the colors I have here are the lightest and the second darkest color uh, of a set. I do have one tone darker, like more intense of the bluish color and uh, a color that's in between of these but I did want some contrast for this project so uh, yeah it's, uh, it's a nice project to work on but I'm not really sure how long I will knit this I think I am currently at in somewhere in the sixth repeat let me count that one two three four five six yeah I'm in the sixth repeat I think the picture showed that there were seven repeats but it wasn't really a clear picture because it was folded and it made it hard to count the number of repeats from the picture and also like if she knitted to, to a different gauge then that might mean an entirely different size so yeah I don't know anyway so let me know what your favorite length is for a cow and uh, yeah liking the brioche so uh, yeah uh, I'm definitely going to knit some brioche again in the future. We can move on to the next project that I've been working on a little. Um, this actually was on a wheel for quite some time, but now the first bobbin is actually finished. Uh, this is obviously uh, something a yarn that I'm spinning myself. This is just a single ply. Uh, so I finished spinning the first single uh, of this. I have 500 grams, so half a kilo, I don't know, maybe a pound? Is it a pound? <laughs> I'm not even sure right now. Anyway, uh, of yarn, this is uh, Wensleydale wool from a company called Wensleydale Long Wool. Uh, it's, I think, a British company and I purchased the fiber on the Edinburgh Yarn Festival a few years ago and I'm really enjoying spinning with it. It's a very long staple length wool uh, which makes it somewhat easier. It's also quite slippery, like it's not as grippy as uh, like a BFL is, so it's slightly more difficult. I'm also trying to spin it slightly thicker than I uh, used to and I want to make a three ply out of this because I still have this kind of dream to knit myself a white uh, cabled sweater and for uh, a sweater with cables I do think I prefer a three ply or up but considering my spinning talents, it's probably going to be a three ply. Um, making more than a, a three ply on my current wheel is also quite difficult because I don't have enough bobbins to to make it um, more than a three ply. So that would require rolling it off into a ball or maybe using bobbins from my other spinning wheel. I have another spinning wheel that. For some reason I don't understand suddenly started working again after we moved here so I don't know what happened in the move but it, it, it went, went the right way like uh, I'm more used to things suddenly not working anymore after you move them but uh, this thing decided to suddenly start working again um, there's a pedal and it would move against the wheel all the time before and now it suddenly stopped doing that so maybe I should try spinning on that wheel sometime too but for now it's on the attic in the storage and it fits really nice under the like the, the what do you call that angled roof piece uh, in our uh, camp nest so uh, it's going to stay there until i finish this project i think so uh, i think that's it for the spinning content but that's not all because i've been doing 
quite a bit apparently. I thought I didn't do that much but that's probably because I don't have that many knitting projects on the go at the moment but uh, I do have a lot of other projects so yeah. Um, then something I want to uh, talk to you about is weaving. Now here is one of my first uh, weaving finished <laughs> objects and um, yeah <laughs> this is a bit of a disaster. I really thought that I had uh, woven a piece that was slightly longer uh, than this so I had hoped to get like at least three of these kind of cloth pieces out of it that were like <laughs> at least square but uh, apparently I gave up way too fast but I got really frustrated with uh, warping uh, the loom for this yarn. Uh, it went wrong and then uh, I made some other mistakes. There's also a weaving mistake here, but I don't really care too much about that. Um, I'm not really in love with this yarn anymore and I wanted to use it up. I wanted to try the technique so you can see that there's a pattern going on here. It's a really easy pattern basically to weave. Like, um, like usually I would go like one color, next color, but at some points they're twice the same color next to each other. And the same for the for the yarn that I wove through it, but apparently I only had a very short piece, and then I gave up. And I finally actually finished it because this uh, piece, uh, the weaving, has been done for quite some time. And I may already have recorded a podcast where I have shown this piece, but with all the tails still hanging on it, uh, I frankly can't remember, and I didn't go back to check. But um, yeah. So this is the final project that I got out of it and uh, yeah, I will admit it's a bit shorter, <laughs> a lot shorter than I had hoped. But there you go, I was done with this project, I wasn't enjoying it anymore so I'm glad I finished it and um, for now it's uh, kind of big enough to be a teapot so cozy so uh, there, there you go, it's a teapot cozy now. So. But what uh, that meant was that I got some space free on my loom again to, I would say cast on, but it's not really the right word uh, when it comes to weaving, I think, uh, to start warping another project. And I actually uh, took down my uh, loom from the attic and uh, brought it here so I can show you. So this is what I'm currently weaving on. I really hope that you can see because for me it's really difficult to see the camera but since the woven fabric is now in between me and the camera I think you should be able to see it. Um, yeah, it's a project that is uh, somewhat easier to weave. I just need to count the rows and then switch color in time. Uh, the pattern is uh, nice and easy. And uh, yeah, it's uh, smooth sailing for now. Uh, the yarn that I'm using is uh, Holst Garn, um, uh, Holst Garn Super Soft in uh, four different colors. So there's the dark blue that I think is called something like marine. There's the um, the lighter blue color that's called aqua or aquamarine maybe. And there's cobalt and there is a pinkish color that I'm not sure if it's... I don't think it's aubergine. But I'm not sure what color it is. Anyway, <laughs> so um, maybe I can still look that up and see uh, what the color way name is. But uh, yeah, I uh, <laughs> funny thing is uh, I actually made uh, mouth masks a while back, and they came pre-printed. But one of them had had like a print like this on there, also in pretty similar colors, I, I think. And I like this, so I decided, yeah, I want to weave that. <laughs> so uh, I finally decided to cut off the weaving for, for the uh, previous project for my teacup cozy, uh, or teapot cozy, teapot cozy words. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I uh, decided to uh, start weaving. Uh, this is an Ashford uh, rigid heddle loom that I'm using, and I actually purchased a stand for it uh, because. Um, before I was only able to use the loom when I had enough space on a table. And this may sound a little bit ridiculous, but I tend to keep a lot of clutter around my table, so I did not always have the space to start weaving uh, on the table. And that meant that 
I would not be weaving at all. So now I have a stand for my loom that uh, allows me to just put the loom anywhere and I just need to fetch this chair and I can start weaving. Which actually meant that I have been weaving a little bit more uh, lately. Still not a lot, but uh, <laughs> it makes it a little bit more worth to have a loom at all. So, uh, yeah. I, I think this is quite ironic because my sewing machine is like always on the desk and it's not a problem and there's a lot of clutter around my sewing machine as well, but I will make sure that I can still uh, sew things. But for my loom, apparently it's not the same, I don't know. Uh, lacking some motivation there or, or something, I don't know. But um, having the loom stand actually made me use the loom more, so I'm glad I did purchase one. So, uh, yeah. Um, also, one thing that I learned with this project is, um, as you may be able to see, I don't know to what extent you can see it, but there's a floral print paper that I'm using here to roll in between uh, the warp threads here. Um, and this is just some wrapping paper, but uh, the wrapping paper was not exactly the right size for my loom. Like, the gap in between here. It's supposed to be 60 because it's a 60 centimeter or 24 inch uh, loom, but it's slightly more than that. Uh, so I actually measured uh, this width and uh, I cut, I, I trimmed down the, the wrapping paper, but that didn't work quite as well. So for the other side, I, <laughs> I purchased some very uninspiring grey paper, uh, a bunch of sheets, but they are pretty much exactly the same width as the, as the loom. And that means that um, you can't, like if you slightly uh, shift the, the paper over to the left or to the right, you get up and you end up with bulges on, on the edges, which is really annoying, especially if you have long lengths of, uh, of the paper. So I purchased a set of papers that did match my looms, luckily the size existed. So um, yeah, it was quite expensive because it's a uh, big paper, like a um, much bigger size than your average uh, home printer can handle. But uh, yeah, it definitely also made the weaving more enjoyable. So if you are struggling with that uh, yourself, then I would definitely, I would definitely recommend looking into that as well. I mean, it, it just saves a lot of frustration. Then there is one more craft to talk about and that's obviously sewing because as I mentioned my sewing machine always needs space. So uh, I can't even show you all of the sewing projects because uh, yeah, uh, I make things for my son and um, my son tends to keep spare clothes and stuff at the daycare so one of the projects that I made was a sleeping bag for him. Uh, and it's at daycare, so I can't show you because he needed a more summery one because the summer weather is finally, finally here. <laughs> and uh, I don't enjoy too warm weather, but I do enjoy a little bit of sunshine and a little bit less of wearing sweaters all through the summer. So, uh, yeah. So here is another shirt that I made for my son, um, which is obviously here. He's grown so much. <laughs> If I look at this and then look at the the tiny clothes that he wore when he was a newborn, then oh my god, he, he is a huge guy right now. But uh, yeah, I really like this print. Um, I made this shirt several times before, but I don't think I've made it in a short sleeve version uh, before. I just um, folded up the pattern to a length that looked good. And uh, yeah, decided to wing it from there. So yeah, a short sleeve uh, shirt for him. And uh, yeah, it's a really nice and light uh, fabric. He loves print and uh, yeah, it looks good on, on him. So yeah, one more project uh, done. As always, I don't know what the fabric uh, is. This uh, pattern is called um, long sleeve envelope holes t-shirt. It's a Dutch pattern so I'm sorry uh, it might not be as easy to follow. It's a free pattern though so I will link uh, down the, uh, the shop where you can find this pattern and uh, yeah I think it comes in sizes like from newborn to to 
to something like uh, three or four years old. So um, yeah, um, and uh, I've been enjoying the pattern, so I can definitely recommend it. Uh, one thing I have done in the past um, is uh, add some snaps on um, on the neckline to help close the t-shirt but I found out that I mostly needed that because uh, I let my son wear some shirts while they were still slightly too big for him because I prefer making a shirt that he will like be able to wear for a long time instead of making him a shirt that he might not fit again in a month or so so uh, I want to get some wear out of the projects that I make this time he actually kind of fits in this size so he doesn't need to the extra snaps anymore so, uh, yeah, then there is one more project because I've also been sewing for myself. So then there's the last project that I wanted to share with you and that's this shirt, this sleeveless shirt that I made. It's a pattern by Quick Sew and there's probably a number and I will put it down on the screen and in the, um, in the show notes which will be in the description box below the episode. Um, yeah, uh, this is just some basic jersey fabric in a um, single color, so I don't know if it even has a brand, but if so, it's not known to me. Um, I don't remember the shop I purchased it from either, I know for sure that it's online. And I found actually a very nice fabric store uh, in my new hometown, so uh, yeah, I, I will probably <laughs> work a little bit more with fabrics from there, but Unlike yarn that comes wrapped with a label on it so that you know the brand and you know the the weight and everything, fabric tends to be sold just by the meter and you're kind of lucky if you even can find the price per meter and uh, the contents and um, yeah, I feel like it's more, much more difficult to find all the details about your fabric um, in a fabric store than it is for yarn because the yarn comes with a label that usually tells you everything although this fabric store that I do like for the fabrics also has a yarn um, section that also has some yarns that don't, don't even specify what type of fiber it is I mean come on is that too difficult to tell me like if it's acrylic or there's some wool content in there uh, I mean that seems just completely silly to me you want to know what you're working with right and uh, sometimes it's very easy to feel uh, what kind of fabric you're working with or what kind of fiber you're working with, but sometimes it's not, uh, especially when it comes to blends. So uh, in that case, I do want to know what I'm working with. So please, please give me a label that tells me the details. Um, and as I mentioned, that would be nice for fabrics too. But yeah, if, if you feel like I'm usually skipping over what fabric I'm using, it's usually because I don't know, <laughs> because it, it doesn't specify anywhere. But this will be um, probably, a, this is a cotton blend with probably some, um, some elastone, they call it in Dutch, I'm not sure if this, that's the uh, right uh, word in English too, but some elastic uh, synthetic fiber, like maybe 2 to 5% or something um, to help keep its shape after use. So uh, yeah, it's finished uh, and uh, that's it for today. So thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have you guys here. Also, I did pose a question earlier about the length of the cowl. So please don't forget to tell me what's your favorite length of cowl. And uh, after mentioning that, Thanks again and I hope to see you all soon. Bye!